The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, as your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, ascended into the heavens, so may we also ascend in heart and mind and continually dwell there with him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Greetings on this Feast of the Ascension, one of the great festivals of the church here. And we are going to be looking at the first lesson for the Feast of the Ascension from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. There are two historical renderings of the Ascension. Both of them are in Luke, the end of Luke's Gospel and the beginning of Acts. And they are really, in many ways, the event that ties together the two books. Um, this is a, a text that has more than the Ascension. Uh, the Gospel lesson, obviously, for this Sunday is from Luke 24. And I believe it's uh, verses 44 to 53. Part of that was the gospel lesson for Easter 3. So if you preached on the first part of that in, in Easter 3, that's Luke 44 to 49, you can preach on the last part here, 50 to 53 on the Ascension. And I think you could include this text because you could talk about the two different dimensions of the way in which the evangelist records the Ascension. Now, I could get bogged down in the first part of this because it's so rich, it's so wonderful, and I'm going to make a few points here, um, and I, I, I could get carried away, as it's, you, know, you might expect. This is Luke, after all, and, and he is um, somebody who is near and dear to my heart. Um, to start with, let, let's just look at, at how you know, he, he describes this gospel, and he starts with the ascension. It's right here. This is the language of, of Luke 9, 51, the analepsios. The, uh, you know, Jesus turns his face to, be, you know, to, to go up into Jerusalem. And, and the, you know, his going up to Jerusalem is seen as an ascension. And here the language of ascension is used it up. You know, and until the days of his ascension. So there it is. Now, Luke calls his gospel the first word. Um, excuse me, his gospel, the book of Acts, the first word. He calls his gospel a diegesis, which is a, um, a leading out, you know, a narrative. And, um, you know, one of the, the, the things about being the first word is he's talking about the, the story of Jesus. And that story of Jesus is now going to continue in this story of the church where Jesus has become a person you know, by the Spirit. And you can see the Spirit is referred to immediately there at the beginning. And I, I highlighted all the places where the Spirit is, is going to be referred to, and I highlighted them in, uh, in this blue color. I'll underline it here in, in red. But, you know, what, what you see here is, is G, uh, uh, Luke trying to tell us here what Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, this is part of what I call the prophet Christology. You know, with the, with the teaching really being the first part, and the doing are the miracles. And what happens to Jesus because of this is he is rejected. And now I think this is a kind of a throwback to what Luke is all about, especially in the Galilean ministry, but all the way through. And in, in a way, the, the first word is about the fact that in this teaching and miracles, Jesus is bringing in the new creation. That's what he's doing. It's performative speech, and it's miracles that testify that he, in fact, can do that. Um, commanded his apostles through the Holy Spirit, whom he elected, and this is until the days of his analepsios, and until his ascension. So the ascension is, is marked here as the kind of the turning point between Luke and Acts. And I, I think it's really interesting that he, he begins that way. Then he talks about the resurrection in the language that he uses in the resurrection account. Why do you seek the living one among the dead? Okay, um, here he is the living one again. After he suffered, so there you, you have right away the kerygma 
So here's a summary of his gospel in terms of teaching and miracle workings. And then here is his rejection and resurrection. So you got the whole kerygma. So if you're looking at it, here's the first phase and here's the second phase of the prophet Christology. And this perfectly parallels Luke 24, 19 to 20. 19 to 20. And then through many various signs until the, the 40 days, 40 days, there's the 40 days. And, and during this, these 40 days, and here, I, I think you have the liturgy. He was speaking about the things, and those are the passion and resurrection facts. That's a technical term from Luke 24 about the passion and resurrect concerning the kingdom of God and eating salt with them. This is a meal. And I, not, not many take it this way, but I think you, you have here word and sacrament. And here you have from Acts 10 how he, excuse me, how he ate and drank with them. I think it's verse 38. How he ate and drank with them after he rose from the dead. And this is what I call table fellowship. So there's your table fellowship. So you have the prophet Christology and how that prophet Christology during these 40 days is embodied in the table fellowship of Jesus with his disciples. Okay, I'm moving quickly here. But, I, I mean, there is so much to say here. It is really quite extraordinary. Um, you, could, you could really put the whole sermon out on this thing, on this particular part. Here is another reference to the promise of the Spirit, of the Father, which is the, excuse me, the promise of the Father, which is the Spirit. And, and he does go back to John the Baptist, interestingly, how he baptized, and now they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit after not many days. Now, this is obviously a reference to Pentecost. And if you know anything about the way I handle the, the progression of baptisms in Luke and Acts, that from John the Baptist until Pentecost, you have this entire process of baptism where Jesus is baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. Excuse me, he's baptized, oh, I can't erase that, with the Holy Spirit. And then on the cross, he's baptized with fire, and that these come together at Pentecost. So the Holy Spirit here is the culmination of this entire process at Pentecost. And I think John is suggesting that here. Okay. Um, now, the disciples, of course, get in the act by their sort of inane question. And I think it's inane. Not everybody does. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. I put that in a, in a purple color because it's not really the kingdom of God as I think we think of it. They're thinking probably in po political terms, you know, in, in social terms, maybe even military terms. And Jesus, I think, gently correct them. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, the kairos. And here's the Father again. So much Trinity here. Spirit, Trinity, you know, here's the, obviously the Spirit again, you know. But um, you will receive power when, you, um, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then here is the, the, the whole missiological thrust of, of really the, the first century. And, and the, the, I, I want you to see how this how the mission flows out of everything that comes to here. So the mission is founded on what comes to this point. And the mission is, in a sense, the way in which Jesus now talks about how he is going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Because they are going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And I take this as Rome and, surprise, surprise, Spain. Because Spain was actually considered the ends of the earth, and I think, I think you know, Paul got there. Um, and, and I mean, th this is the program of Acts, and this is the program of really the mission of the church. And it's, it's, it's just, if you just go back and look at the whole section here, I mean, it is quite amazing what we, what we have. He, he summarizes his gospel in terms of prophet Christology, okay? He talks about how Jesus kind of ta taught this in, in his, um, 
his eating and drinking with them after he rose from the dead, the things concerning the kingdom and eating salt with them. Um, then he talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. Then he, he talks about how that is going to be understood in a baptismal context, referencing Pentecost. And then you have this kind of conversation between him and his disciples concerning the nature of the kingdom. And Jesus gives his missiological thrust there in um, being witnesses from Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth. Okay, that brings us now to the ascension. Can we get all that in there? Not quite. Okay. Um, the, the ascension is told as is everything that is of significance in Luke. Um, after these things, saying them, you know, they're looking up and he, he is, he's taken up. A cloud overtakes them, you know, from their eyes, takes them from their eyes. They're looking intently into heaven. I, this is a remarkable statement that he uses. This, this is a technical term now um, for, uh, in the gospel for the journey to Jerusalem. And now it's used. And I, and I think it still, you know, has the sense of pilgrimage, the sense of journey. Um, it, it, it is, a, I think, a, a great statement of what it is that is happening now with his journeying into heaven. Um, uh, as he's journeying, behold two men. Now, some of you know this. These same words are used at the transfiguration, the resurrection, and now here at the ascension. You know, and here, of course, it's Moses and Elijah. Is it Moses and Elijah here? Are they the witnesses? Are they the witnesses here? All glimpses of glory or full-blown expressions of glory. I don't know. But these two men are standing with them in white clothes, just like at the resurrection. That's not that long ago from our preaching. And, um, and what do they say here? And what, what they say here, I think, is so important. Um, they call them what they are, men of Galilee. And they ask, I mean, this is, uh, uh, again, another gentle chastisement. Why do you stand there looking up into heaven? It's like their mouths are hanging open and they're seeing him leave. This Jesus hears the word, analeps, face. It's the same one that's used in 951 in Luke's gospel. Uh, from you into heaven, you will thus see him uh, coming in the same manner in which he is, and there's that language of journey again. I, I don't think it's insignificant, okay? Now, why, why am I saying this? Well, I think the journey is, is a cosmic journey, and this would be something to preach on in the Ascension, that Christ is like an alien who comes down from heaven. He invades, you know, born of the Virgin Mary. This is the creed, uh, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. Okay. This is the analepsios. This is what 951 is. You know, he turned his face to go to Jerusalem for his lifting up. And the, the movement is down into the ground and then back up into heaven. And it's the seed that is planted in the ground and then rises again. It's this whole journey back. And, and I think that's why this word is used. This, is, this, this has really the feel of destiny. And of course, it is the destiny in Jerusalem, but it's more than Jerusalem. It's the restoration of all of creation here. Through Jesus, the creator, coming to his creation, being buried in the earth, and then rising back and taking all of creation with him. And in a way... What this does is it, is it goes back to the, and this, this is what, where I would connect this, this goes back to the kerygma at the very beginning. You know, his teaching and his miracles, you know, his, um, his atonement, his resurrection. And look at what's in the middle there, right there. 
analempthe, okay, his taking up. So if, if I were preaching on this, I would preach, and, and I'm talking about connecting here the gospel and this first lesson. I would preach on this journey from heaven back to heaven. And as I said, this is the Nicene Creed. Look at it. Nicene. I got that wrong, but you know how to pray. Nicene Creed. This is the Nicene Creed. And this is our baptism. This is where we, we suffer, we die, we rise with him. This is the church year. And this is really at the end. Well, we got Pentecost coming, but this is the end of the festival part of the church year. And so, I mean, there, there is built into this text, along with the gospel, the great opportunity to, to preach something that, that we have not seen really in, in a, a, a long time in terms of the Lucan uh, program of Jesus coming from heaven and returning to heaven. And, and I'd just like to suggest to you that one of the great um, ways for our people to see themselves right now on this Feast of the Ascension is that this story that is told of Jesus is their story and that they are, they are taking that journey with him. He, he incorporated them into that story when he was, you know, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's what Pentecost is about, how Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit and fire, fire that purifies now. Uh, the, 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 the water and the spirit and the fire that has been, you know, sort of gone through the gauntlet of the cross that killed Jesus, you know, because it was the wrath of God. That now purifies us. And we're incorporated into that, that journey, you know, by baptism. And that we're really coming to the end of that story, at least in terms of the historical uh, part of the church here, the, the Christological part. And now we're going to live out that, um, certainly with Pentecost and Trinity and then the whole Pentecost season, you know, by seeing how we live as those who have taken that journey with him. So what an incredible, you know, feast to preach on. And it's too bad it's on a Thursday. It's too bad more people don't celebrate it. It's too bad that more people don't go to it because it is one of the great feasts of the church year. And may God richly bless you if you have the, the opportunity in your congregation to celebrate the ascension of our Lord.